anthropologists look at the structure and function and the rules and procedures by which people organize themselves and live in the world. Looking at how economics, politics, culture, kinship and cosmology are entangled in people's everyday lives. Using methods of, of long-term immersive field work which often involve both participation and observation combined. Because it's so effective at exploring what Bourdieu calls silent traditions, i.e. the cultural aspects of life that we find very hard to talk about because we take them for granted in the form of assumptions. And they ask actually, what does that experience look like? What are the relationships through which people kind of make sense of their lives um, with others? And thereby anthropology encourages awareness of different ways of thinking, different ways of looking, different ways of living and making meaning of ourselves and the world around us. Anthropology has been described as the most humanistic of the sciences and the most scientific of the humanities. Balancing subjective understanding and objective analysis of the matter makes ethics in anthropology different from other social science disciplines. I think anthropology is very tuned in to the fact that actually our data and our knowledge is produced collaboratively and it's a, a kind of an intersubjective experience uh, that takes place within the ethnographic encounter with other people. Being ethical as researchers is a continual ongoing process of negotiation as it is between any group of people. So in international coalitions, discussion is needed within a collective to work out what the group finds um, ethical in a way that doesn't necessarily impose, for example, UK ideas about what ethics amounts to. And this kind of ongoing continual negotiation is also important for asking each other whether or not you're living up to your promises and if you're not, what you can do about it. Reflexivity is a really interesting concept. It helps the individual to pose and revisit already held positions and attitudes. Anthropology isn't a laboratory science. It isn't a test of a hypothesis and, and a determining an answer. It's an ongoing dialogue or conversation and encounter with a set of complex and messy and sometimes contested realities. is about acknowledging that we live in a world of inequalities and that we are shaped by our histories, our geographies, our experiences. In any conversation, anthropologists have to ask themselves, who am I speaking to? How am I speaking to them? What's being said and who's saying it? How does that affect me? How are my own beliefs and uh, knowledges uh, affected by this? How do they cause me to see this differently? What different views are coming across here? And how do I understand the, what, the reasons for those differences? And you can't stand outside that process because it involves getting into processes of relating with other people. So to do good research, you need to make your own involvement and your impact on the research, how your thinking affects the way you see and the way other people see you. Um, you need to make all that part of the inquiry so you know what kind of impact you're having on your own inquiry. Anthropologists use different kinds and forms of data 
data such as text, audio, video and other forms are first transcribed into the language of the field or the language of the community the anthropologist is studying. And this data is finally translated into the language of the researcher or the language that the researcher is using. At one point this would have been to shore up the colonial enterprise. It has also turned its attention to development and to development discourse and praxis, as well as to uh, decolonizing. I think a really exciting trend uh, within anthropology is how might it benefit the lives of those with whom we study? How might it contribute to um, policy change, for example, or advocating for more inclusive democracy, or in the case of the global comparative ethnography of parliaments, politicians and people, you know, how might parliament and parliamentarians maximise the opportunities to engage with various publics? Hmm, this is tricky. It's, it's different from other fields of observation, exactly because of this collective character of decisions made inside it. And here I'd argue that actually it doesn't, that parliaments and those that work in them have um, distinct cultures, have rhythms and rites and, and, and rituals that order activity. And in this, they're not really any different from other uh, field sites, other cultures, other societies. Uh, they're no different from groups of villagers in the Indian Himalayas, for example, or people going to work uh, in gold mines in South Africa, or take another example, Wall Street bankers. They are a collective institution that brings together people who think in different ways, in many cases, think in opposite ways. You know, they have parties from a complete opposite sides of the political spectrum and so they represent everyone but at the same time they represent no one because you won't find someone who agrees with parliament all the time so it's, it's an institution that is bound to disappoint it's an institution that is bound to have people don't necessarily agree with it if you see them from outside it seems that all political actors have the same amount of power and influence but we know that this isn't true so when you are looking inside the parliament you have to understand how the distribution of power is operating and where uh, people are acting to get more power uh, where the relationships are being more conflictive in the way they are distributing power. So this is a very different point of view from other institutions that have a single command, for example. Um, it might need um, a communication skill is slowly maybe needed in the case of um, research by anthropologists. One thing we have to bear in mind when studying parliaments is that this institution is a collective political actor, which means all decisions are not made by just one person, one group, or one segment of society. Instead of this, decisions are made in a complex relationship of different interests, opinions, and demands. But parliaments are also highly sensitised and sensitive environments. You know, this is where the work of legislating goes on. Parliaments are institutions of paradoxes. They are public, but they are private. They, are, they belong to the public, but at the same time, they are part of an elite. 
and and so the collective of the institution and the fact that it brings different people from very opposite sides they all re- work together makes it a very unique type of institution for an anthropologist to understand how parliament works or what parliament is or how parliament uh, operates really need to get to know the people within it and getting to know, understand the subtle side of politics access can be even more difficult and herein lies a tricky problem if you want access to scrutinize powerful people they might worry about whether or not you're going to criticize them and of course you don't want to promise that you will portray them in a rosy tinted way because that would compromise your scholarly integrity and your your aspiration towards academic freedom so there is a tension sometimes between securing access and academic freedom and bearing in mind that often what an anthropologist will see on the news or what is seen outside is probably not what actually happens within parliaments because parliaments do have a very paradoxical na- nature between what's shown outside and what actually happens or the reasons why things happen within the inside. It's, it's a place full of performances for lots of different reasons. The structure of parliaments is very difficult to be understood by from just one perspective. Because of this, is a very interesting to have some kind of comparison and different ways of looking the same phenomenon.